Hey everyone, welcome back to this sort of mini-series that we've now started on text displays, and I am both excited and dismayed to tell you that I've fallen back down the rabbit hole of building these things. Now, what that means for me is a lot of wasted time that I could have been doing other things, but what that means for you is we've got more stuff to talk about. But before we dive deep into what we're actually going over today, let me give you the 10 second rundown of what happened last time. First things first, we created a font that I did primarily by stealing from somebody else, but also doing some of my own character work. Spoiler alert, we'll be using the exact same font today, except the T is a little bit curvier. Then we did a bunch of designing, designed a modular feed tape layout for all of our text to be stored inside the module, designed counting systems, fixed a bunch of problems, got together with a bunch of people to do a final design, as well as doing some weird tangential decimal display stuff. And the manifestation of my viewer base in my head might be asking the question, okay, you've built this, now what are we talking about today? You see, in order to make myself look better in front of the people who are already still watching, I've specifically omitted all the horrendous flaws that come with this design that we're hopefully going to fix in the future ones. The first major flaw that we had to address was the fact that the system was essentially brainless. It took the most simplistic approach, and that was basically having to return to the very first character in your system before accessing anything. If you wanted to go from A to B, you had to be prepared to burn the entire alphabet, decimal number system, and a bazillion characters into your retinas before you could even dream of accessing the character that you wanted. Combining this flabbergastingly inefficient counting setup with the fact that this thing has to lug around a gargantuan tape of 265 blocks long, being 4 blocks wide, as well as being forced to do 265 cycles for a full loop because of the inefficiency, you end up with 280,000 blocks being moved for changing a single letter. That's not even considering the vast number of modules that you're going to be actually stacking next to each other to convey those letters into actual words. So I guess I want to give a big shout out to Mojang for making a game that can handle that, and a massive anti shout out to me for being a complete moron. So now let's actually fix these problems. First issue that I want to address. If you actually look at our data stream, you'll notice that we're storing a ton of garbage. That's in the form of these black concrete bars. The purpose we had for these was making sure that when a letter was actually in the right position, unlike all these other ones, it would actually have these sealed at the top, leading to less exposed machinery and easier readability. When it comes to addressing this inefficiency, the solution for us is actually pretty simple. Instead of storing the black bars inside of the data stream passively, we can actually just actively incorporate it into the display. Now, what this actually means in practice is using some sticky pistons on the top and the bottom in order to both extend and retract the black borders so when we need it on, when we're looking at the display, and when we need it off, when we're moving it around. However, this change isn't so simple as just implementing it, because it means we have to get a bit more creative with how we move the blocks around. Right now, we're actually now using the black blocks themselves and the sticky pistons to push the purple blocks down, and we're also using some honey blocks attached to the black border blocks themselves in the back to push the purple blocks down when they end up in this position. With this new display, we're actually going to be able to cut down the length of the feed tape by a solid fifth, because that means we only need 4 blocks of length per letter. We're also going to be removing 5 characters, knocking it down from 53 to 48 for a reason that I'm going to discuss later. Before we get into the keyboard layout change, we're actually going to be talking about another thing that you may have observed in this new design, and the fact that it's ridiculously fast. If you're wondering how fast, this new design can run on a 12 game tick timer, as opposed to the 18 game tick timer. This is just a little bit over once every half a second, which contrasts heavily to the once every almost full second for the previous one. Now a difference of just over half a second compared to a almost a full second doesn't actually sound like a whole lot when you think about it, but when you're running this machine hundreds of times, saving those six game ticks actually translates to a lot of extra save time. If we combine all of our features, I'm not going to get too deep into the math, but essentially our new layout is an increase from 4 minutes 
to one minute on average time it takes to get to your destination. You might also notice when the second design we're dividing by this mystery constant too, and that's essentially counting for the fact that we don't have to, on average, do a full cycle due to the brainlessness of the previous design. On average, we only need half a full cycle to get to our destination with the new design, so that's why we're able to divide by two. Now onto the most important feature. How did we fix the insane brainlessness issue of that previous design and make it so this thing can actually manage itself and count to the destination without having to do an arbitrary extra cycle to reach a home destination? But before we get into that, I just want to say if you're liking the video so far and you want to see more stuff like it, make sure to like and subscribe, it helps out a ton, means a lot. And now let's actually talk about this final feature. And as a sort of hint, it's going to be entirely extraneous of the methods that I thought I was going to be using for the previous video, because we're totally ditching the dropper counters. Because apparently, they have one big design flaw. And in order to demonstrate this immense flaw, I'm going to ask you a question. In front of you, I've got a dropper counter, and what this essentially does is it counts from 1 to whatever number you set it to, which in this case is 48. And the big question that I'm going to ask you, the viewer, is how many items are in this right dropper? Because the thing is, is that I actually have enough viewers to the point where it's statistically likely that some of you are going to get this right, so comment down below if you do get it right. But the reason I'm asking this is because it's actually impossible for you to tell. You can gather a little bit of information from the signal strength of this wire, but ultimately it's too imprecise for you or any redstone machine to know what state this dropper counter is in. And the reason this is important to us is because the simplest solution to our problem, getting from point A, in this case it's K, to point B, which might be T, would be to just keep cycling forward until we check the current state and realize that it's T. But the thing is, is that if our machine has no way of reading the internal state of the counter, just like you had no idea what amount of items were inside, it's impossible for us to do that check. So what we need is a counter that is able to be read from the outside by a machine. Oh, by the way, the number was 14. Now, let me offer you a different situation. In front of me is instead a binary counter. See? It counts. Now, if I ask you the question, what state is it in? You might not be able to tell me. In fact, actually, a large portion of my audience probably can read binary, but that's not really a point. Imagine if you can't. You probably wouldn't be able to tell me exactly the state it's in, but what you can tell me is if it matches this other set of states, to which you'd reply, no. And just as easily as you could do that, a machine can too. So if I give it a letter, indicated by this binary string of blocks, and I simply ask it the question, okay, is the current state of our internal counter exactly like this binary string? And to which it replies, no. I know that I have to move forward another step and check again. The reality is, is that the machine doesn't even have to understand what binary even means, because all it has to do is be able to count and tell me if it matches the desired output. This means that we can essentially just keep going through the entire list of letters, and will inherently always take the shortest path, because the moment we come across the letter we're looking for, we'll know we're on it. In actual practice, I won't get too much into the details here, but we've taken our binary counter and we flipped it on its side, now it's vertical, and our desired input, the black blocks, is represented by these trap doors on the side. Actually, this isn't full binary because technically at the bottom here we've got two complicated binary counters that act like a ternary counter, and I won't get into the details, but if you want the details, make sure to check the description. Anyways, we've almost come full circle. We've got an incredibly fast version of the old machine, and we've given it brains that will allow it to travel directly to any letter we're looking for. All it takes is taking the corresponding binary information from this big chart, flying over to the back of the machine, inputting it using these levers on the back, and then hitting this trigger switch. But wait, you thought all the technical nonsense was over, because there's one more problem. You see, as I mentioned earlier, unless you're probably a lot of people in my audience, binary isn't very friendly to people. In fact, it's so unfriendly that it requires you to reference this big giant chart every single time that you want to input a letter. And for long strings of sequences, well, that's gonna get tedious. 
In order to solve this problem, we're instead just going to force the machine to remember the binary instead in the form of this big ROM drive, which we're going to tell it what to do using barrels filled with items. We're going to run those through a sorting system, which I have shamelessly torn off the 3D printer, and that's going to tell every single one of these inputs exactly what to put into each of the modules. Now, it was only there for a brief moment, but you might be wondering why our keyboard layout looks so interesting. And that's because I've gone ahead and assigned every letter to an item that I think represents that letter. Here we have Apple corresponding to A, H corresponding to Hopper, U corresponding to Netherite upgrade, that one doesn't really line up as well. But basically, you get the point. It also makes it a lot easier to read messages when given a longer glance, as well as construct them because it's a lot easier to find the letters that you're looking for and place them in the right places. So, with this blaring in the background killing my game, I think it's about time to do an outro. We've successfully revolutionized text displays by not revolutionizing it at all and providing a pretty bad solution. But what we have done is had a lot of fun and designed something that at least looks mostly cool when it's done working. Once again, I'm going to give a shout out to the Discord server. Announcements, teasers, or really anything I'm talking about, make sure to join. I've been working on this project for a little bit now in VC, so if you want to chat with me, or help me out, or just see what I'm up to, make sure to join. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe, check out my other content, and I'll see you next time.